So as you read in the presenter notes, um, basically when John invited me to speak at the conference, I said yes in 15 minutes, in 15 seconds. I really wanted to help, I believe he deserves it, and want to be part of his success in this. Um, the problem though, is that I usually speak at conferences, and this is the first conference I ever spoke at. Uh, this is a, an event in 2001, a big event by Italian standards. This is an Italian event that took place around 2000, and had over 1,000 people attending. That was my very first event, and um, it, was, it was quite shocking for me to go on stage. And from that moment on, I always spoke on stage, so for over, over uh, 15 years now, almost 15 years, and hopefully, when I go on stage, I say interesting things, right? And so when John said, you need to come up on stage and talk about yourself, your career, your life, I was, okay, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll try, but you can blame me, which is the story of our relationship, friendship, right? So you can blame me. Okay, so the first, the first one, the first real job I got is, uh, was in this company. It's called uh, Arnoldo Mondadori Informatica, and there is a division that is education. So this is the biggest publisher that exists in Italy. And at that time, they had a business unit that was fully de dedicated to educational courses. Okay? So I started a job as an IT instructor. At that time, I wanted to become a lawyer. And uh, so nothing to do with it. And because my family couldn't support me from a financial standpoint in doing that, and I tried to work and study at the same time, it didn't quite work well, I ended up in the security underground community doing a lot of bad things. And because this is live streaming, I will not say exactly what I was doing, but certainly bad things. And so over time, I ended up setting a job at this company, and I created for this company the first ethical hacking class uh, in Italy, and one of the first in the world. And this became hugely popular uh, class in Italy, and this was my first opportunity to get in touch with large enterprises, big banks that were, that were in, in the country. At that time, I was still working focused exclusively on the Italian market. Um, it was a lot of fun. The company allowed me to study, to take certification, IT certification. I took a huge number of certifications because I really believe in the power of knowledge and the value of knowledge. So even if I couldn't become a lawyer, I wanted to study, not stop studying. And so there was a point I was the most certified, or one of the most certified person in entire Italy. Um, one of the many things I did was going on stage, as you saw in the previous slide, uh, for that conference. And that was, that, was, that was really propelling my career as a speaker. And the other thing I did was writing a book, a small book about security just in Italian language, which is the one that you see here. It didn't, didn't have much success, to be perfectly honest with you. And one thing I learned, one thing I learned is that I don't want to write a book anymore, really not. Because when you think, when you say yes to writing a book, and some of you wrote books in this, in this audience, I'm sure, you have this image of yourself getting inspired and have this creative flow getting in, into your body, you start writing. No, it's not like that at all. You just have a publisher that pushes you in a very frustrating way to deliver chapter after chapter after specific deadlines. And it was a very frustrating experience. The only thing I remember is that I spent the whole, su uh, whole summer close into a room writing this, this, this book. And yeah, so I would never write a book anymore in my life. But this is not a real, the real lesson I learned from this experience. The real lesson I learned from this experience is that there is an immense value and an immense cost in talent retention. At that time, in 2001, uh, Mondadori was one of the best IT uh, course providers for Microsoft, Checkpoint, uh, Red Hat, and other classes. And there was a lot of competition in the nation for that. And there were a lot of different kind of institutions that were trying to fight for the same few handful of speakers and, and, uh, and teachers, IT instructors. So the game that Mondadori played at that time was um, offering exclusive contracts to IT instructors. So I had to sign an NDA and I had to sign an, an exclusive agreement such that I couldn't go and work for any other company. And so even if there was not enough people for me to, do, to deliver the class, I, could base, I was paid to stay at home. 
And during that time, the free time, I was able to study and take exams and certifications and so on. It was hugely expensive for them. But at the same time, gave them a tremendous competitive advantage because the best people, I'm not talking about myself, but my colleagues that were way more experienced than me at that time, were working exclusively for them. So that was very big lesson I learned, one of the first in my career. So this was my security period. My, my career is divided in three, three areas, so security, virtualization, and then cloud computing. So this was the security period. And at some point in time, during the security period, a friend of mine, another instructor, came to me and showed me this little thing with virtual machines from a company that was called VMware. And uh, this was something like two years or three years after VMware launched. I believe it was 2002 or something like that, 2000, yeah, probably 2002. And I was hugely fascinated by this. Because when you do security classes, you are into enterprise security, you need to set up a lot of different machines to simulate an enterprise DMZ and try to walk into it. So it was, was very expensive in terms of resources, equipment, which, which I didn't have. So virtual machines gave me the way to do it with just one single machine. It was, it was hugely valuable. But at the same time, I, I recognized that there was something very big in front of me in terms of technology. And I really, really wanted to, really wanted to explore it more. So what I did was being silent and study as much as I could about virtualization technology at that time for almost one year. So being silent for one year. And then after one year, I really started to feel the need to aggregate more information, to research more beyond what was available online at that time. The problem was that at that time, the industry was just at the beginning. That was not a virtualization market that existed today. Many of you come from that era, so that you, you might remember. There were very few news outlets out there that were covering virtualization news. So if you wanted to have an understanding of how the industry was evolving, it was really hard. At the same time, and totally unrelated to this, completely unrelated, there was another emerging technology which was called blogging, okay? And blogging at that time was mostly about writing your personal things, like a personal diary, and things uh, like, you know, I ate a, a cheeseburger yesterday, and I was really not into that. I said, well, this is probably not interesting enough. Not even, I would not read my own stuff, so why bother? Uh, but I was fascinated because one of the things I do is always try new technologies when they come up. So I really wanted to try blogging, and I wanted to find a way to aggregate the news for myself as a research tool for virtualization. And so I ended up deciding, I had this, this idea that changed my life, literally, it changed my life, which was, if I'm taking the news that come out from the different news outlet, that was very sparse kind of effort at that time, and I aggregate them into a blogging page, okay? I'm trying the blogging thing, and I'm aggregating to a news about virtualization, so I accomplished two things together. And I got incredibly lucky because the keyword, the main keyword for virtualization, which is virtualization, was available as a domain name with the .info uh, extension. And so I registered virtualization.info, and I started virtualization.info exactly 12 years ago, September 11, 2003. And that really changed my life completely because that tool gave me an immense visibility worldwide and put me in front of uh, Fortune 500 companies, most influential venture capital firms in Silicon Valley, uh, press, top analysts in the world, everybody. I was the guy that was aggregating the information about virtualization, and that per se was not big value at the beginning, okay? But after two years, and this is a very important point in the story, after two years that I was just aggregating news, my brain started to make connections that eventually other people didn't see. So I started to see a few dots and connect the dots together into patterns. And so I started to add just below each quote from each article a two-line sentence or a small paragraph, which my blunt, shameless comment about the vendor X or Y or Z. So it was, infre it was not infrequent to see things, to read things from me like, oh, this vendor is saying BS because they are announcing this product today, but this is the same product that they announced six months before. So it's not really, it's not really true. So this was the beginning. And eventually, this thing, this adding two-line sentences, as you know, became a thing. And one of the most powerful and one of the most financially rewarding form of blogging that exists today at a professional level, which was curation, right? 
Think about uh, daringfireball.net, for example, okay? So I was doing curation 12 years ago, before the word even existed, I believe. I'm not sure. I was certainly one of the first, um, without knowing. So this was uh, an amazing thing. And it was one-man show, meaning one-man business. And because I was saying things in a way that nobody else was saying, and in a very straightforward way, and I was the only one aggregating all this information, what happened is that a lot of people started to pay attention. And a lot of, of vendors, some of them are here, other, other ones are in the audience today, uh, came to me without having any marketing, every, without having any sales, and offered me sponsorship. So he became a revenue stream for me, sponsorship, without me doing absolutely anything. He became a huge business, a really, really big business. And that was amazing because I got to a point where one of the boutique analysis firms at that time, the Burton Group, that eventually got acquired by Gardner, uh, noticed me and um, invited me to speak on stage. And uh, eventually they wanted to hire me and they made an offer for the website because the website was, 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 was really worth, worth uh, it was a big business. And so when I received a seven figure offer for the website, I kind of, I kind of or realized that I was, I was into something really big. Um, I rejected the offer, by the way. So. <laughs> let's not, this is live stream, so let's not go too much into this. Huh? All right, one of the things, so this was one of the tools that I released, uh, the, the roadmap presenting, you, you cannot see it very well, but one, um, all the list of the different product releases that occur over one year time frame. And I believe this was a high quality tool in a sense. It was, it was well done. It was done with a specific purpose. One thing I learned from this experience is that quality matters. Quality matters. Quality really matters. The website was horrible in terms of quality from a language standpoint because as you can tell, my English is really, really broken. And at that time it was horrible, much more than now, as I said yesterday evening. But everything, where, everything else was really high quality. The website design, the advertising platform, these tools, there was a Japanese translation that was done by a professional Japanese company on a daily basis within 24 hours from the release of my news in broken English. They were translated in, in, in good Japanese language, okay? And everything else was, even the things that were not obvious outside, were done in a really high quality. Quality matters, it makes a huge difference. It's a huge differentiator, so don't compromise on quality. This is, this is what I learned. Eventually, I ended up in Gardner. So the Burton Group got acquired and became part of Gardner, and then they continued to chase me for, for being hired, and I eventually said yes. And I ended up being research director in their most technical division, Gardner for Technical Professionals. And in that role, I wrote pretty much uh, most of the research that they have on a specific kind of tool that most of you may be familiar with, which is called Cloud Management Platform. And it was a blast. It was the most amazing experience I have ever had uh, in, my, in my career. It was incredibly different from being a blogger, in a sense, or being an independent uh, analyst. And he put me in a team of amazing people that today are CTOs in different companies. One of them, Chris Wolf, is the CTO of America's for VMware, uh, and, and many others that, are, that, that they were in that group. And it was an amazing experience. It was amazing because these people collectively had this huge knowledge that we were sharing, that they were sharing with me, we were sharing with each other. And it, the sharing was, was happening through this very brutal um, process that was the peer review for the documents. So in Gardner, what happens is that when you, write, when you write a research paper, you need to submit the research paper to your peers in the industry that have your same expertise, and you get peer reviews. So you get comments that you need to address. You're, you are allowed to reject comments, and you can do whatever you want, because at the end of the day, you have a responsibility for that paper, so there is your name and your credibility, but you receive comments. Now, this team, the specific team I ended up with, was the most brutal team in terms of peer review in the entire company, I would say. And so for a, pay, for a paper that was just 20 pages long, I could receive 600 comments. 
that would take two days just to be read, okay, and not, not even processed. It was unbelievably brutal. No matter how good you thought you were, no matter how big your ego was, at the end of the process, you just want to go back and cry to mama. That was, that was the only thing you could do. It would destroy your ego, no matter how big it was. And it was amazing. It was amazing. So I ended up being famous in this, in this, um, in this experience because I wrote, I wrote a paper which is, which is called Evaluation Criteria for, uh, for Co-Management Platforms. And uh, it, it, this got famous, but as I say, infamous, because if you are familiar with Gartner, the average, the average length of Gartner papers is between half a page to 10, 12 pages, depending on the type, the format of document that you have to read. And I ended up r r writing 139 pages. I clogged the publishing process in Gartner for something like one month or so, because all the peer reviewers, the publishers, all the team were just spending the entire summer reading this dumb document for me. It was, it was, really, it was really a thing. And today, this document is still used, three, three years after I, I, I wrote it, it's still used by huge amount of Fortune 500 global 2000 company to understand what are the requirements and the features that I should look for in a, in a, in a cloud management platform kind of, kind of technology. Um, the one thing that I learned in this experience is that no matter how great you are, no matter how qualified you are, without a team, you can go only up to one point and not beyond that point. And to go beyond that point, you really need to have an amazing team. And together, collectively, you go from good or very good or, or amazing to incredible. That's the only way to get to that level. Okay, so I ended up moving from there to where I am today, Red Hat. So in Red Hat, I'm the GM for the Cloud Management Strategy in the Management Business Unit, which means that I look at a broad set of technologies, not just cloud computing. Certainly, that is a big part of what I do, but it's not the only one. I look at Internet of Things, the machine learning, and a lot of things that I cannot disclose here for obvious reasons. And um, I take care of different, or I, but I influence and I support the different functions in the organization, marketing, sales, uh, merge and acquisition, so business, uh, business development, uh, many, many different functions. It's too early to say what I'm learning here, especially because, again, there is a live streaming, so I don't want to get in trouble. Um, but, but I'm learning a huge amount, okay? So this, this could, be, could be nice to come back here in a few years, assuming I will leave the company, which is not safe, and, uh, and tell what I learned about, about this experience. This is, this is another quantum leap compared to what I used to do in Gardner. It's, it's, it's amazing how much I'm learning, uh, m learning here. All right, so this is basically the three periods, uh, security, uh, virtualization and then cloud computing. Now, how, how did I get here? What, is, what, is, what was the, the, the secret sauce, if you want to call it that way? Beyond luck, because there is a big luck component in all the careers, I believe. So the first one, it seems obvious and it seems kind of a joke, but it's really not, traveling. Traveling is incredibly important. I believe we were, somebody said this yesterday, yesterday evening, traveling is incredibly important. Because if you don't travel, you don't have a chance to get into where the action is and have the luck to be the right person at the right moment, but not just because of that. It's because it gives you the opportunity to meet amazing people and gives you the opportunity to see familiar things done in a different way, from a different perspective. And that opens your mind and makes, lets you make new connections. So traveling is incredibly important. I travel for 15 years of my life, on average two weeks per month, every month of the year, including August and December, which is an awful lot of traveling. And at some point, I was traveling so much, I kind of after the second, third year of my career, that my friends started to think that I was some sort of glamorous playboy going around on a jet, surrounded by breathtaking women. It was unbelievable, right? And I got so sick of, me, of, 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 of this misinterpretation of what I was doing that I decided to start a collection on Facebook, right? I started to, 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 to try to show my peers, my friends, that, my, that the experience were really different. 
So I didn't, I didn't know what to do, and I decided to take one picture that was always recurring in every trip, which was the bedside table in the hotel rooms. So I ended up with huge amount of pictures. Oh, by the way, this is getting worse, just so you know. So, so <laughs> if you're traveling in an economy, get ready, because this is getting worse, right? And so I ended up with this list of, this list of bedside tables on my Facebook collection. And when I saw how horrible these things were, I consistently saw from every three, they started to realize that, no, really, you not, don't have the glamorous life that we thought. Oh, good. So when I reached 100 pictures, I stopped eventually because looking at them was, was too sad, really. So I decided, let's, let's, let's just not do it, right? So this is number one. Number two, not compromising. I said no a lot of times in my career, very many. I said no to business deals. I said no to partnerships. I said no to job opportunities. I said no to a lot of things. And saying no and not compromising is one of the most powerful tools that you have. And it may sound like scary, in a sense, because the moment you say no to something, you, you, have, you lose something, right? And human nature is such that you try to avoid losing stuff. But when you say no, you actually freeing up yourself for the opportunity to get yes to what you're really looking for. So when the real opportunity comes in, you're free to take it. And that is very important. If I have one regret in my career, is that I didn't say no enough. And trust me, I said no a lot of times. So I would, I would have said no more times. The other thing I did, the other part of the secret sauce, I guess, is keeping it simple. Uh, you can say by the, the kind of style that I have in this presentation, that I try to keep the language very easy, and I try to use analogies as much as possible. And it's created a distinctive style in terms of presentation that, that people seem to like, seem to appreciate, because I tend to translate even the most complex uh, uh, terminology into something that, that, that is easier to understand. And the reason for that is that very early in my career, I read this quote from Albert Einstein, which is, if you cannot explain to six years old, you don't understand yourself. Now, there are different versions of this. Let's say that this is the official one. And that sentence was incredibly powerful and really shaped my communication style for the rest of my life. So when I talk to folks internally, I read that, and before that, when I ship a marketing message, when I write a blog post, when I create a presentation, always thinking this needs to be incredibly easy. Because when your message is really, really easy, it gets really powerful, believe it or not. A lot of people believe that the, 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 the easiest becomes the less powerful, and it's exactly the opposite. And allows you to reach a broader audience beyond what is your expectation. So keeping simple is incredibly, incredibly important, at least as being for me. All right. And because I don't believe in jargon in any possible way, I always have tried to simplify the message as much as possible. And that is paying off. Really, it's really paying off. All right. So this were the, this were the, the overall secret sources. But I want to close this. Probably I'm already beyond my, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right, with the top, top three lessons that I learned overall in my career, not just in specific companies. Lesson number one, your credibility is all you have, okay? You don't have anything else. Yes, you have your skills and you have your experience, but the problem is that if you have just the skill of experience and people don't believe in you, okay, that will not let you try new things. And conversely, if they believe in you, even if you don't have all the skills at the right moment to accomplish the job and be successful or the experience, that will let you try new things. So defend your credibility, build your credibility, defend your credibility at all costs because it's all you have and long term it will pay off. And I mean decades later. The second lesson is that you really need to take risks. You have to do that. You need to take risks and you need to try new things. But in trying to understand what is risks, I had to think myself, okay, what, is, what does it mean taking risks? And uh, taking risk is trying something new, yes, but at the same time you can take new, you can try something new and not take risks, so it's not that. Um, has to be something else. And I came with the conclusion, at least that is, 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 is good for me, which is taking risk is about behaving and acting as you would have nothing to lose 
but your credibility, as I said before, right? So there is this quote from Steve Jobs, and I know that quoting Steve Jobs is so cliche, but damn, the guy was right. So uh, it, it, that this, this really resonates with me. This is exactly what, what, what I think when I, when I take risks in my career. Remembering that you, I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment and failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You're already naked. And this is exactly the point that, that is important to, uh, to go forward and take risks. Now, before you leave this room and you go taking crazy risks, okay, let me, let me say one thing. So first of all, if you're a surgeon, this doesn't apply to you. This advice doesn't apply to you, okay? Forget it, this is not for you. Repeat, it's not for you, right? Okay, I took this immense risk when I started my first in my first company, the Mondadori Education for the security class. I wanted to prove to the CEO of the company that they really, that there was a real need to educate people how to defend against hackers. So what I did, I sent an email to him that included the Trojan horse, and as soon as he opened the website, as he opened the email, I took a screenshot of his email, I took a picture of him with the, with the webcam, and one minute later, I sent an email to him uh, with his face, uh, reading the news, reading my resume, and I said, you really need a security class. <laughs> and that was the most stupid thing I ever, ever done in my life. And this guy could have called police, and I would be in jail now, and he didn't, he hired me. Okay? But the point is, and I discovered this months later, is that he was so furious that he took a chair and threw the chair against the wall. That's what he did. Okay? So take risks, but not that much. Okay? It's just a <laughs> little less. All right. Now, second part of the two, number two, you need to be ready to face failure. When you take a risk, you need to be ready to, to, to accept risk, to accept failure. Now, setting failure is already part of the risk management culture that we are into today. But this needs to go one level beyond that. I'm really, I really believe, and I learned a hard way in my career, that you need to embrace risk and accept risk and welcome risk as a healthy part of your career development. It's incredibly important to accept and embrace risk in a way that we're not explained when we are in school and university and so on. I'm not suggesting that you need to throw a party, just to be clear, but certainly you need to think that is a very healthy part of your, 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 your career advancement. Uh, and the last thing, number three, you say cute pictures of animals. That's the best they could come with. <laughs> number three, and I promise this is the last slide, uh, nothing is impossible. Really, absolutely nothing is impossible. When I look at my career, and I look at what I did, okay? The humble regions, the development, what I accomplished, and so on. Virtualization.info had over 7 million visitors when I, when I left the company per year, 7 million, which was for a very niche website. Blogging with a little quote, it was quite, quite, quite a thing, okay? It's uh, absolutely nothing impossible. So don't let people, and you have no idea how many times in my career I had people saying no to me. You're not qualified for this job, and I really was not. You cannot do this, you cannot do that, okay? You don't have the experience to do that. Don't let people tell you what you can and cannot do. And even if somebody already tried your idea and failed, that doesn't mean anything. Because you might have the capability to execute that idea in a better way and succeed with other people fail. So don't let anybody say no, and don't think that anything is impossible because it's absolutely not the case. Thank you very much.